Welcome everyone to Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. I am so excited to be joined today by Sharon Bennett Connolly. I've been lucky enough to hear her speak a couple of times recently with, hist with Historic Lincolnshire. And so um, I'm just so excited to have her here on the podcast to talk about some women that we may not know as much about as we should. Let's put it that way. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you, Caroline. And I'm going to just jump right in and ask what got you interested in history and in particular in women in history and some of these lesser known, we should know more about women in history. So tell us that. Well, what got me interested in history? I've loved history as long as I can remember. And I was asked this a little, little while ago and I suddenly realized exactly what it was. And I was about six years old in primary school. And we had a visit from a local museum with um, clothes for, for us to try on. And they were Victorian dresses. And one of the items was Queen Victoria's bloomers. Um, my friend Nikki got to wear those. I, wore, I dressed up in um, a Victorian maid's outfit. And looking back now, I don't think they really were Queen Victoria's bloomers. <laughs> they were probably replicas. But that's where it got started. And ever since then, I've just loved it. And for Christmas, when I was eight or nine, I got a book. Here you go. The Kings oh, and Queens of wonderful. Britain. And it's really tatty now. But the number of times this book has been opened, I don't think there's a year, and I'm 52 now, where it hasn't <laughs> been read at least 10, 15, 30 times. So oh, I used to just wonderful. go through. It's just full of pictures and family trees from William the Conqueror all the way through. And it's just absolutely just a lovely, fun read. And that's really what got me started. And I still use it as one of my research books as well. If, I'm, if I want mm -hmm. a quick look at a monarch, mm -hmm. then that's great because it's got all the general stuff in it. Oh, um, it's a great wonderful. starting point, you know, for jumping off to others. Well, that's a good reminder, I think, to all of us that you're never too young. And I um, have some little granddaughters I'm indoctrinating very early on. So <laughs> yeah, I indoctrinated my son very early on. Uh, we went um, dragon hunting around mm. Pickering Castle when he was three. Oh, perfect. And ever since we have just done history together. Tomorrow we're going to the Imperial War Museum at Duxford, which oh, is the, uh, the plane museum. Mm -hmm. So he's an early mod he's a modern historian, whereas I'm a medieval historian. So I don't know where I went wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. And and we want to cover all, all of the bases. So that's wonderful. Well, that's really it is a wonderful family thing. And I appreciate it your is. sharing, you know, how early you started. And it's fun to yeah. hear all the ways people get interested. So do you think it was because of the clothing, maybe, that you're so interested in women's history? Not at all. I was okay. never interested in women's history until I, I was interested in the battles and mm. the kings. And um, thanks to Bernard Cornwell, um, my teenage years were the Peninsula War and the French Revolution and all that kind of thing. It was literally um, after joining Facebook, I saw all these Facebook groups for, med for kings and men in history. And I just sat there thinking, why isn't there one about the queens? So I started this group, Medieval Queens. Uh, it's now called Medieval Queens and Heroines. And I started writing mini biographies about queens and famous women from history. And then my husband bought me a blog for Christmas. He didn't know where to get me one Christmas, so he gave me a blog. <laughs> And so uh, those biographies transferred onto the blog. And um, I just realized that there wasn't a lot out there about women. And yet people were interested in them. You know, the blog was going from strength to strength. Everybody's reading the articles on the women. If I put an article on a bloke up, it got read, but not as much as on the women. So that's where it started. And it was like, because I always thought, I think... Because at school they didn't concentrate on the women and they barely got mentioned. I always thought they sat at home sewing and didn't do anything else. You know, raise the kids, do a bit of sewing, that's it. But mm -hmm. then when I started looking into them, it was like, 
And God, these women were amazing. And they did things in a time when women weren't supposed to be exceptional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they weren't supposed to stand out. And the ones that did stand out had to get mentioned by the chroniclers, but it was always grudgingly. So right. it was like, I just discovered that they weren't these little people who didn't do anything. They'd been ignored mm -hmm. and not mentioned, but they had been doing incredible things. So after that, it was like, right, this is my bit. <laughs> and I, it's just, it's been amazing just realizing how much there is to write about them. And it's an area of history that's still got so much to be explored. It's right. Brilliant. <laughs> and and it's wonderful. And I know one of the things I was reading recently on your blog about Christina de Pazan, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about her because she's just so fascinating to me. And that just really jumped out at me as someone that, you know, not everybody knows very much about, but this is the quote from you. I loved um, the first woman in history to make a living from writing. I yeah. just love that. So can you tell us a little bit about her? Because a and lot just, of us are writers. So I thought that was yeah, wonderful. Exactly. And just imagine if it wasn't for her, we might not be doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. sure women would have eventually started making a living from writing, but she started it off. And um, she did it because her dad died, her husband died, and she was the breadwinner. She had no choice but to go to work. And what she knew, the one thing her father had made sure of was that she had an incredible education that was exactly the same as her brother's. Her father believed in female education. So she was capable of writing. And she took on job in work as, as a writer, you know, just marking down like the monks did in the... Um, in the monasteries doing the chronicles and things and then she started getting commissions to do work like a life of a king and writing poetry and then she wrote this um the city of the ladies mm -hmm. and she was just she was writing about women or women but also for men as well you know mm -hmm. um the, I think it was Philip of Burgundy commissioned her to do some work and things. You know, she was writing for everybody, but she was a woman in a time when women didn't write. And the only, uh, it's funny that she wrote a book about battles, but she knew it wouldn't sell if it had a woman <laughs> having written it. So she did that one under a pseudonym. But it's the only <laughs> one she did under a pseudonym. All the others, the biography, um, the City of Ladies, they were all done under her own name. So it's not just that she did it. She did it as a woman and made sure everybody knew that she was a woman when she was writing this. And that is is really extraordinary when you think of the time. And I would have to yeah. say quite a bit of, of market savvy there to know that the battleship book wouldn't <laughs> sell under her name. Yeah. But, but this that's was... the time was. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. this was the early 1400s. She was a contemporary of Joan of Arc. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote a poem about Joan of Arc. So, you know, this is the Hundred Years War. Right. It's, what? Six right. And, and years ago. And people do sort of have the assumption that women weren't even able to read. Yeah. And many, many weren't. Literacy was very limited all across mm -hmm. the board, men and women. But it's wonderful to think, you know, her father believed in her education. Yes. And then she was prepared to be, as you say, the breadwinner mm -hmm. in this amazing way and get these commissions yeah. from some of the leaders of the time. And you do wonder what she what she would have had to do if her dad hadn't seen to her education like that. You know, she suddenly found herself with looking after her mum, her niece and her own children and herself. Mm -hmm. No. What options women had in those days usually she must have thanked her father every day that she could actually do something that didn't degrade her and that made her useful mm -hmm. and that she could do something that made her so independent rather than having to find a husband or become a prostitute or whatever there were so many limited the, her life was so limited except for the fact she had an education and she could use it Right. And that's an extraordinary story. Just that. So I, yeah. I was, I was really excited to read that in your blog and I wanted to make sure everyone knew these are the kinds of things that we can find 
about yeah. women that we might not have known about. So I, I think that's really wonderful. And I want to talk a little bit. I want to even go back further in time to the ladies of Magna Carta. That was one of the first books of yours that I read. And so I'm, I'm really attached to it. You know, sometimes when you meet someone through a particular book, you remain really mm -hmm. attached to it, even when I read a lot more. But um, what inspired you to look at Magna Carta? Because I think a lot of us think of the document or we think of John or we think of the barons. And yet there are women in that story too. There are. Um, well, it was my first book was Heroines of the Medieval World. And that was inspired by two particular women. So had very, they were contemporaries, but they had very different experiences. One was Matilda de Breos, who was a victim of King John. Um, she was starved to death in a dungeon um, with her son. And um, she inspired clauses 39 and 40 of Magna Carta, which, was, which are basically the right to trial by jury to not be imprisoned until you've faced a, a trial and to, to not have your justice sold, you know, to have it, to have blind justice. Um, so she was one and the other was Nicola de la Haye, who was an ally of King John and defended Lincoln Castle basically against anyone who tried to attack her. Um, at least three sieges. Um, mm -hmm. and if, one you can count as a fourth even and um but she was and when she defended lincoln castle in 1217 against rebel barons and an invading french army she was in her 60s you know so mm -hmm. it was those two women and a few others on top i thought oh i could write about ella of salisbury as well and i could write about isabel d'urbigny and i was there thinking there are so many women who inspired Magna Carta, some of the clauses of Magna Carta, who fought through the wars mm -hmm. of Magna Carta and had an impact on um, the times. And then the women who actually used Magna Carta to defend their own rights. And when Pen and Sword said to me, would you like to propose a book to us? I said, this was one that was already ruminating in my head that I thought, I could write that. Nobody's looked at Magna Carta from the female point of view, and there is so much of it. Um, so I, su I suggested it, and they just went, "Yes, please." <laughs> <I'm> like, oh. <laughs> yes. I could write it then, but yeah, but yeah, I'd written about those two in Heroines of the Medieval World, and I thought there's definitely more to write about them because Heroines is just like fifteen hundred to two thousand word mm -hmm. biographies of about sixty odd women. So it was like, I can actually expand and each of them gets a chapter right. in Ladies of Magna Carta. Yes. And then of course, um, Nicola is uh -huh. in her own book now. Right. But so that's a transition. <laughs> ladies and now Nicola. <laughs> right. So, so tell us now that you're shifting to really deep dive, right? Into Nicola and all that she was and really expand her story for us. So I was wondering, as you've continued to research her, you must be very fond of her because this is another treatment and an even deeper treatment. Have What kinds of things have you found about her that were maybe a surprise to you? Well, I think um, the thing is that she, she wasn't just a figurehead. She defended Lincoln Castle and she did it in 1217. She was the one who was in charge. You mm -hmm. know, she had a deputy, Geoffrey de Serland, but she was the one who John had placed in charge. She was the first female sheriff ever appointed in England. And um, by all accounts, she did the job really well. And she, um, but it's like the difficulty was reconciling the fact that I thought Nicola was amazing. And she supported King John. <laughs> right. I was going to ask about that. So what's their relationship? Probably and... the worst monarch in English history. <laughs> well, then again, I think John gets a bit of a bad press. I think, yes, he did some he did some really bad things, and you can't justify what he did to Matilda de Breos. But he also, he was a very active king, and he travelled around England an awful lot, and he was very, he loved the law. He was very interested in the legal aspects of ruling the kingdom. And he was very loyal to those who were loyal to him. Mm. 
So Nicola, he calls her my beloved Nicola de la Haye. And um, she was loyal to him. She had lost Lincoln Castle because of her husband's support of John in 1191. She was um, deprived of Lincoln Castle in 1194 when King Richard came back from crusade. And one right. of the first things John did when he became king in 1199 was give Nicola and her husband the castle back. And for that, she was very loyal to him. And then in 1216, when he arrived at Lincoln one day, he um, Nicola met him at the gates, the East Gate, with the keys to the castle and tried to resign, saying that she was too old and frail to carry on. She was a widow by this point mm-hmm. and um, not intending to marry again. And she was basically um, resigning, saying, I'm too old, I'm too frail. I'm giving the job back. And John gave her the keys back and said, Nicola, I would that you hold the castle as before until I say otherwise. Basically, keep hold of it. because You can resign when I tell you and not before. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I always thought, oh, oh, this is really nice of John. And then I thought about it and I thought, this is play acting. Mm. This is Nicola and John turning, standing there in front of their households Nicola saying to John that she's too tired, John actually showing that his trust is in Nicola and that he continues to trust Nicola, despite the fact he could put a man in charge of the castle. He's like, no, you are the person to hold this castle and I trust you implicitly. And it's John showing Nicola that he trusts her, but it's also John showing his followers Mm -hmm. And those who might argue against a woman being charged that he trusts Nicola mm-hmm. and no one else is getting that castle. And he was right to. She defended it manfully, the yes. chroniclers said. <laughs> yes, which is funny that that's how they describe it, right? Yeah, they didn't know how to describe a woman <laughs> acting like that. They couldn't say bravely. They had to say manfully. manfully she did yes. like a man or without thinking of anything womanly. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So why do you think John was so willing to continue to support her and to publicly support her? Because he faced ongoing battles and challenges. I mean, it wasn't an easy reign from his perspective. No, he did. He knew she could hold Lincoln. Mm. She'd done it in 1191 against... Um, the justiciar at the time, William Longchamp, had demanded that her husband, Gerard, hand over Lincoln Castle to him so that he put one of his own men in, in charge. Um, Gerard, in order to avoid this, went to John and swore fealty to John so that John would help him. But in the meantime, he'd left Nicola in charge of Lincoln Castle and Longchamp had marched north and laid siege to the castle. 40 days and 40 nights but he wasn't getting in he had to march away again because <laughs> Nicola wasn't letting him have it so John knew Nicola mm-hmm. could defend that castle no one knew the castle better so who right. would you put in place also to be fair John didn't have a lot of senior barons left <laughs> you know, a lot of them had defected to the French just because they thought John was going to lose mm-hmm. and they only mm-hmm. came back when they realized that actually the French weren't going to give them any favors because they didn't like the English barons who'd gone over to their side because they thought, well, you're traitors. Right, <laughs> right. Trust them. And they realized that actually, you know, there's only one side we should be on, the English. So um yeah, but John didn't have he didn't have a lot of options. But to be fair, he didn't need one with Lincoln. Nicola was the right person to hold Lincoln and she proved it. Right. And she proved it without when her husband was there. Yes. But also when he wasn't there. And so I just find that extraordinary. Her husband must have had a lot of faith in her as well to leave her there to defend at that time, their castle when he left. Right. Yeah, He must have done. He must have known that she was capable. I mean, she'd known Lincoln Castle all her life. Her father Mm -hmm. had owned it before her. Mm -hmm. So it was her castle. It was in her name. You know, Gerard only had it because he was married to the marriage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She wasn't going to give it up without a fight. And even with the fight, she wasn't going to give it up. (laughs) Well, that's what's extraordinary is this image that you create of her defending, you know, they describe it as manfully 
but mm-hmm. it was a role that was usually played by a man, but she continued to play it. And yeah. that scene you described with John, where he's being very public about his support, yeah. which shows that he had um, a stake in her success as well, right? Yeah. He was willing to be public about, no, yeah. I still need you. Um, and 60, honestly, was old for men or women in yeah, those days. Exactly. I mean, that was an older time. So a it, retirement. Also showed, it also showed Nicholas Garrison that John trusted her and mm-hmm. that she was still in charge and mm-hmm. they were under her command. Um, right. That's why I think it was play acting. There was so much of it that was like, you know, this is a demonstration of trust and loyalty on both mm-hmm. sides. Mm-hmm. And yeah, not a private conversation, but, (laughs) but for both of them to do that publicly in that Mm -hmm. format was so powerful in a time where, you know, access to power was often through battles. And so for her to be in charge of a garrison like that, a stronghold like that Mm -hmm. was, was really extraordinary. So that's, that's a wonderful story. So tell us about researching, because of course, these are really old records. So how do you find the information about these people? Well, I'm really lucky in one respect. I have a friend who, Louise Wilkinson, she's actually a professor of medieval history at Lincoln. And she did Nicola de la Haye for her dissertation. So, and she lent me her books that she had copied out, transcribed all the charters that were related to Nicola, to her husband, to her first husband, to her family, and there's just tons of them. And I, I, instead of me having to go and do, go mm-hmm. troll through the archives, I just had, I had Louise's work and, um, and also archive.org mm-hmm. and British History Online. And there are so many things online these days to find um archive.org has all the old um chronicles like henry of huntingdon and audric vitalis and i could luckily one of the the vitalis wasn't in the original latin i couldn't find an english version but i did find a french version so and i can read <laughs> french so i was like you <laughs> right Right. So, yeah, it was just amazing the amount of information there. And Louise put me in touch with um, a few other um, academics who helped me out with a few questions. And um, it was brilliant. The amount of information I got about Nicola, it was like, yeah, I can do a book about it. <laughs> See, and that's great because I think another thing we don't realize is how many records there are from this time period. And that they are accessible if you speak French or Latin, mm-hmm. able to, you know, but that you can look for and find these yeah. women's stories. It does take some digging, but these women's stories yeah. are in and there. And we have to actually thank John mm. because mm-hmm. he was a prolific letter writer and his okay. letters are still surviving. His letters, his close and, let, pay, and letters patent are still around. So, and a friend of mine, Rich Price, had transferred translated them all from the latin to the english oh, great so um i managed to get everything from those that were related to nicola like things like nicola you need to send me this ransom money and things <laughs> like that <laughs> and there... i'm collecting money i need money nicola send me money and oh so know, that's a great was, view of their amazing. relationship yeah you can really yeah. see the two of them um and and you know this is giving me at least a little maybe a different view of him that he was able, I mean, he did do some terrible things, as you say, and you, you can't just dismiss them, but you also see him making some good decisions. And that's the thing that sometimes gets overlooked. We forget people are pretty Mm -hmm. complicated and they do good and bad. Yeah. But trusting things like, it's like so basic, you know, Oh, he lost Normandy. So naughty John, he lost Normandy, he lost the French possession. So that's laid at his door. And it's like, actually, the Plantagenet Empire under Henry II and Richard I and John, it was never going to survive because as soon as the French had a strong king who wanted his French lands to be under French rule, right? it was going, you know, it was failing. It was already falling apart in, in King Richard's reign. It was only Richard fighting constantly that was holding it together. 
and he right. wouldn't have been able to hold it up for much longer than he did anyway. <laughs> right. And Richard, therefore, because he was always fighting, was never in England. No. So John made the decision to be in England and there were benefits of that too. So yeah, the thing is, John had to, had to be in England because he lost Normandy. And he also lost the revenues from Normandy. Mm -hmm. So he had to tax the English barons harder because there wasn't as much land to get the revenue from. And of course, the barons got a bit upset about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they'd also lost their Norman land, so they got upset about that. <laughs> right. So it's it's all more complicated. It's part of a more complicated story yeah. than just him being a bad king. It but is. this this interaction with Nicola and how he was able to see the value in someone yeah. at a time when, you know, a lot of people would have just looked past her simply because she was a woman and, and yeah. he does value her. So that's a really um, interesting point sort of in his favor um, as, as you look at him as a complicated man. So with, with Nicola and, and I'm, I know she's one of your favorites. So, um, and that's been a really great, and that's coming out. So tell us about that book and it's coming out really soon, right? Yes. Um, it's out in the UK on the 30th of May. Okay. And it will be out in the U S at the end of July. Okay. So not long to wait. Not long, and, um, which is very exciting. Yeah, and it's a biography. It's not just really of Nicola. It's of um, Nicola's origins as well. I go right back to 1066 and before because Nicola's grandmother's grandfather was an Englishman. Okay, okay. So, and her grandmother was Eng was pure English. So um, she's got she's Anglo Norman rather than just Norman. Okay. And her links to Lincoln are from her English family rather than her Norman family. Oh, that's okay. So that's a really interesting um, element of her sort of her whole character, right? That she has yeah. this English as well as this Norman side as she is part of the time in history that's ushering in, you know, getting away from some of that Norman and, and becoming more English in England and mm -hmm. all of that. So that's really interesting. Well, that's great. And we'll have all that information, of course, in the show notes. But I want to talk to you about a couple of other things, because first of all, we're really excited about your book coming out. And those of us in the U.S., I do have some U.S. followers, will watch for, sadly, a later, but not too much later, release. But I know um, you also have done, and I believe are doing now, some tutor research as well. And one of the things you did this great talk for anyone who didn't hear it on the women of Lincoln, you know, heritage Lincolnshire, mm -hmm. women of Lincoln. And you were talking about Catherine Parr and you just mentioned something. So this is really something I'm fascinated in her first marriage. So before yeah. she became Henry VIII, six wife, we know she was married twice before, but her first marriage often gets just sort of glossed over really quickly, but you mentioned um, a little bit about that. So can you just tell us, just give us that little bit more insight into Catherine Parr and how she started. Um, she was the most married of Henry's wives, of course, but how did she start? Yeah. What was her first marriage like? Well, that was the thing. I live five minutes from the building where her first marriage, where she lived after her first marriage. Um, and you often read, and I even read it the other day in a book that I thought really shouldn't be repeating this because it was a very modern, it was done in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, it's often repeated that Catherine married Henry because she was used to nursing her husbands because her previous two husbands had been old men. Mm -hmm. Her second husband was. Her first husband was the same age as her. <laughs> right. And... Um, the mix up with the old man is her first husband was named Edward de Borough. And his grandfather was also named Edward de Borough. And they got mixed up years ago and <laughs> thought that she'd married the grandfather. Mm -hmm. And it turned out she hadn't. She'd married the grandson, who mm -hmm. was the same age as her. Unfortunately, he did die young. They were only married two or three years. But she... He was from Gainsborough Old Hall. Um, I don't know if it was called Old Hall then, because it was only 100 years old at the time. Now it's called the Old now Hall. Old. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never actually looked into when it actually became the Old Hall from the New Hall. Um, 
But yeah, she married Edward de Burra and um, she didn't enjoy life at the old hall because Edward's father, Thomas, was a bit of um, an authoritarian mm. and a control freak. And um, she actually wrote to her mother saying that she found it uncomfortable because he was basically controlling their lives. And her mother actually, I think he, she came to visit and um, arranged with Sir Thomas that Edward and Catherine would get their own household um, at a place called Curtin and Lindsay, which is about 10 minutes by car from Gainsborough. But at that time, it would have been about a couple of hours horse ride. Right. <laughs> so, you know, away, set up in their own home, just the two of them to start family life. And I just think it's amazing to think if Edward had survived, right. Catherine's life would have been so different. Mm -hmm. You know, she'd have probably had children mm -hmm. in her 20s and just lived locally in Lincolnshire for the rest of her life. <laughs> right, right. Instead, poor Edward dies after a couple of years and she goes on to marry Lord Latimer and then Henry VIII. Right. Um, yes. And but I do find it interesting. And I'm so glad you specifically clarified that because I've read in several places she'd married two old men, both of whom died sort of like he died because he was old, but young people died too. And that was yeah. very sad that her young husband died and they were both very young. But then as a result, I've also read the other side that she married a young husband, but he was sickly because he died young. And oh. it's like, you know, you can't assume. Yeah. There's no evidence that he was sickly. You can't assume that. They say the same about Edward the Sixth. Yes. But until he contracted tuberculosis when he was about 14, he'd been a healthy young man. That's right. You know, a healthy boy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can't just say that just because they died young, they were always sickly. Right, yes, right. They might have been, but you can't assume that. <laughs> right, and they might not have been. Sudden no. death was not unusual then. Well, especially look at Prince Arthur. Yes, right. The Prince yeah. of Wales contracted second uh, sweating sickness, and that was it. He was gone in a couple of days. But right. There was no, you know, before that, they didn't want him to have sex too young and things like that. But that was just... Right. They wouldn't have sent him to Ludlow if he was so sickly. No, exactly. as they, Yeah. Right. So, so that is, that is a good, we, we shouldn't make those assumptions because someone dies doesn't mean they were old or they mm -hmm. were young and always sickly. It just happens sometimes. Yeah. And, and but they you didn't. You see those assumptions yeah. in so many history books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, but I appreciate you're clearing that up because it does give us, um, we see Catherine Parr a little more, um, accurately for one, but also yeah. completely that she was married to this young man when she was a young woman and probably mm -hmm. had the hopes you just described that they, once they got their own place and got away from his father, that they, they could have had this very nice life yeah. and family and all of that. So um, you just, you know, the accuracy does matter in the way we see these people. So I want to sort of segue from that into what you are working on now, I know Nicola is just about to come out, but can you tell us about what you're working on now? Yeah, Nicola's about to come out. I have another book that will be out in January, I think it is, called Women of the Anarchy, mm -hmm. which is looking at, it's basically looking at Empress Matilda and King Stephen's wife, Queen Matilda of Boulogne. The and, Matilda um, and oh, Matilda. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Believe me, it was so confusing. <laughs> they were all writing Matilda all the time. One's called Empress Matilda and one's called Queen Matilda all through the book so that I keep them straight because I refuse to call Empress Matilda Maud mm -hmm. um, because she wouldn't have known that wasn't her name. She wouldn't have answered to it. That's um, a Victorian invention to distinguish between Matilda the and two Matilda. Of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just think it's not fair that Empress Matilda, the Empress, is the one who has her name changed just to distinguish between her and Matilda of Boulogne. Why couldn't it be Maud of Boulogne instead of Empress? Right, Maud? right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, I'm currently working on Heroines of the Tudor World, which will be out next summer. Okay. Um, I've got a chapter left to write. I've just finished chapter 11 today which was my, the literary heroine. So I've just been writing about Marguerite Angoulême. Oh, and, wow. Um, Louise de Savoy and mm -hmm. um, Catherine Parr. And um, a lady who I didn't know about until um, I started researching this called Margaret Boyd, 
who was the first woman to write a diary that we've got surviving wow. in England. And she wrote a diary between 1509 and 1605. And um, I've just been reading that today. <laughs> that's that's really exciting. What a time period to have recorded in a diary. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, um, so can you give us a little bit of a tease for either of those? You've told us a little bit about women of the anarchy because there are all those Matildas, very important <laughs> to keep track of. And now we know to look for maybe someone we haven't heard of before with a diary. Any other teases you can give us about your upcoming books that we can be looking for? Well, I mean, I've just been amazed with um, Heroines of the Tudor World. It was one it's basically a sequel to Heroines of the Medieval World. Mm -hmm. um, so the chapters, the chapter titles are exactly the same, but for the Tudors. Okay. So I've got warrior heroines. I've got literary heroines. Um, the last chapter I've got to write is the survivors. Mm. So, and it's like the problem with this is there was an abundance of information. With Heroines of the Tudor World, of the Medieval World, I was scratching to find information on most of the women. With this one, I've had to cut out, cut down the number of women because there was so much information. It was like, you know, I could write 3,000, 4,000 <laughs> words on each woman and I'm already going over my word count. It will be about 120,000 words and it should be 100,000. So I'm hoping my editor's not going to be too <laughs> mad at me. But, and you have, but there are women you have to include. Mm, mm-hmm. You have to include the six wives. You have to include Elizabeth the first and Mary the first. So I've been trying to work out how to do that mm -hmm. without having them take over the book. And um, I've done it in a way that I hope works well, which is incorporating them into someone else's story rather than oh. making them the main story. Okay. So Anne Boleyn's story runs alongside her sister Mary. Okay. And okay. Catherine Howard's story runs alongside Jane Parker, Lady Rochford. Okay. Mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping it works. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Well, so, and when you, you're still working on that, do you have an anticipated time that will be out? Um, I'm working on it. It's due in, I should have it into my publisher by the end of this week, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they said they want it. I mean, it's already up for pre-order. Um, wow, great. It's to come out next January, but it won't be next January. That will be Women of the Anarchy, and it will probably be out next June. Okay, okay, okay. So, oh, my goodness. You're always working on so many things. It's so exciting. Um, so how can we follow you and know what's coming up and know the status and when things are released and all of that? Well, I'm on Facebook as Sharon Bennett Connolly, and I also have a Facebook page. History of the Interesting Bits. I have a blog, History of the Interesting Bits, <laughs> which is where the Facebook page comes from. Mm -hmm. um, I keep thinking I should change the page to Sharon Bennett Connolly, but to be honest, I like it being History of the Interesting <laughs> Bits because that's how it all started. I'm right. on Twitter at the mm -hmm. History Bits. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, and I, I do a podcast as well called... Um, a slice of medieval. I nearly forgot the name. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, um, we do, we split our time between interviews and researching a topic. So we've done our recent topic was on Edward the Elder, who was the son of Alfred the Great, and we've had Elizabeth Chadwick on and Matthew oh, Harvey. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's been fun. I do it with um, a historical fiction author. Derek Burks. So we do the history. Mm -hmm. I do the history. He does the historical fiction, and we we both research more or less in the same way. So um, it, it's quite interesting to look at it from the pure history and the fiction part of it. Oh, that is great! Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, I will have links to all of these in my show notes so people can follow you, follow you, and find Thank out you. more and um, be involved in everything you have going on. So I don't know how you have time to do everything because I know <laughs> March was so busy I couldn't believe it. It was like um, I didn't suddenly because it was Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted a bit of me, and it's like. I I hadn't realized until I got it halfway through March and I thought last week it was like, my God, I've got so much to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, that makes me even more grateful that you've taken the time to spend with us and let us get this wonderful glimpse into some women we might not have known as much about, but now we are so excited to learn more and you are the person to turn to for that. So thank you so much, Sharon. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you. your time. And again, it's been so fun to not only read, I felt like I got to know you from reading your work, but then also to get to see you on Heritage Lincolnshire and then finally talk to you in person. So thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been a great treat. And thank you everyone for listening and watching. And we'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.